Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're very excited to have uh, a wonderful parent series this evening from Tina Steam. I'd like to introduce Julie. She's going to lead us in a conversation around helping young people thrive, grit and resilience. And um, that is a real great topic for us to do to support our young people these days. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Julie. Thank you, Leslie, thank you. Hello, Benicia parents. We're so glad you could be here. Thank you for joining us. I know we're all super busy, um, but, but thank you for coming and thank you for those of you who are online. So as Leslie said, my name is Julie. I'm with Tina Steen Plus, and the plus is because we talk to way more than just teens. We talk to K through 12, and we do a lot of parent education. So we added a plus uh, this past year. Um, I've been with Tina Steen for 11 years. I'm the director of programs. And I have two kids. My son, Bryce, is 24, and my daughter, Allison, is 20. Um, so we're, we've been married for 25 years, and we live in Concord, and we love this community, and we love, love coming into the schools and talking to parents. Um, for those of you who do not know who Tina Steam is, I want to tell you just a little bit, just so you have an idea of where we're coming from. So for, this is our 30-year anniversary. So for 30 years, we've been going into the schools and talking to kids about all the things that they're struggling with. We talk a lot about healthy coping, about substance abuse prevention and healthy um, and uh, um, unhealthy choices. Um, we talk about relationships, bullying, peer pressure. And one of the main things we do, one of our primary objectives is when they walk out the door, we wanna make sure they know that they are invaluable and that their value is not based on what they do, it's not based on what they have, but it's based on who they are. So that's a huge part of what we do. And we, we talked to 18,000 students just last year alone. We work really closely with the schools and the teachers and the administrators, and we wanna share all that information with you, and I know it'll be helpful for you in your parenting journey. Um, so at the end of this presentation, you're going to see an email address, my email address, if you want anything, if you have any questions, if you want a copy of the slides, I'm more than happy to send that to you, or I can send it through Leslie. Uh, okay, so tonight we are talking about grit and resilience. For tonight's purposes, resilience is the ability to bounce back from a setback, and grit is the will to keep going when you don't feel like it when you feel like giving up. And to be honest, I'm really glad to, to have you tonight because we are seeing less and less of this. And, and I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, we're seeing a lot of kids just, we're seeing a lot less of this and a lot more unhealthy coping. And the concern with that is then you become reliant on unhealthy coping as opposed to healthy coping and you have to unlearn it. The amazing thing is our brains are, are just amazing and we can unlearn it and we can relearn and retrain our brain to go to healthy coping. But, uh, but that's the big concern that we have when we see what we're seeing. Um, we're seeing kids fixate on failures or perceived failures. We're seeing uh, them just not bouncing back from everyday setbacks and they're fixating on their self image and on um, just this unrealistic expectation that they should be perfect. And as we all know, that's being exacerbated by social media. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which we talked about that in, in December. Um, so we can't keep these things from happening. We can't keep disappointments from happening. We can't keep our kids from getting hurt. We can't even keep them from failing, but we can prepare them we can prepare them from how to respond. We can prepare them for how to respond to failures. Um, there's a book that I always recommend every time I come. Julie Lithgott Hames wrote this book. She was the Dean of Students at Stanford. And she wrote it because the kids that were coming in weren't able to cope, weren't able to function. They weren't able to even make a phone call to make a doctor's appointment. They, um, and the worst part was the administration was terrified because they couldn't, the teachers didn't feel comfortable giving them the grades that they deserved because they were afraid of what they might do if they got anything other than an A. 
And, and to these kids, anything other than an A was a failure. So she wrote this book, and it's been so successful, she doesn't even work at Stanford anymore. She just, she's on the speaking circuit now. So it's an amazing book. I, I hope you'll check it out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we're seeing. And that's, uh, um, again, we just need them to know that we don't expect them to be perfect because there's a lot of pressure out there for, that, for them to be perfect. And, and we know that that's not really possible. So we have a wide variety of kids in here. We have some elementary, we have some adult kids and, and everything in between. Um, but the good news is everything we're talking about applies to everyone. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is teaching and modeling healthy coping. When we talk about healthy coping, we have to talk about the basics. Um, the basics, we can easily just brush over them because they're, they're basic, right? They're not very interesting but it is critical. And as soon as you talk to a therapist about the lack of grit and resilience in our kids, this is the first thing they're gonna say. I, I spoke with two different therapists about this topic just this week. First thing they said, eating and sleeping. Um, so that's, and, and in the high schools especially, um, can anybody guess what the top two things are that we see kids not doing on this list of basics? Number one is sleeping. They brag about it. Um, actually, overscheduling. Overscheduling is the other one. They're, they brag about getting four hours of sleep every night, and, and they're overscheduled. Um, so again, we, we can't emphasize this enough, and especially with the sleep. I know it can be really challenging if they have electronics in the room. Hopefully your kids, you know, they don't. But if they do have electronics in the room and you want some tips on how to, how to handle that, feel free to send me an email because we don't have time for it tonight. But there are some, some tricks that we have that we, that we um, encourage parents to do to just make sure their kids are getting, getting at least eight hours of sleep. One of our speakers, Kendra, shares with uh, students, she suffered from crippling anxiety. And she decided to be intentional about getting eight hours of sleep. And it immediately she could see the results immediately it's easy it's free you don't have to go to the doctor you don't have to have a prescription so definitely that should be the first step if your kids are struggling in any way um, so beyond the basics does anybody want to share what their favorite coping healthy coping go-to is does anybody have anything yeah. oh reading okay i i was going to say i know colleen's is probably hiking so reading yeah, I love it. Hiking, yeah. reading. Anybody else want to share? These are what we hear a lot. So, again, healthy coping sounds so cliche, <clears throat> but I cannot emphasize it enough. I know in my own family, my daughter, when she was in elementary school, she really struggled with anxiety. So she, we had her seeing a therapist, and um, one day she was going, a few years later, she was in middle school, and um, she had some drama going on with some girls, and it was really, really hard. She was in her room. She was crying. She slammed her door shut. She didn't want to talk to me. And she came out a while later. She brought her easel. She brought all her paints. She had everything set up, and she just started painting. And she had this piece over her. Nothing had resolved. You know, none of it had been resolved. But she was just in her happy place. So we really want to encourage our kids to find their healthy coping and, and uh, have that be their go-to because they're going to cope one way or another. We definitely want it to be the healthy coping. Um, beyond that, um, modeling unhealthy coping, what does that look like? Um, that would look like if you come home, I've had a terrible day of w from work, I need a... Yes. <laughs> and, and that's fine if you want to drink, but don't link it to your coping. So that, that's, uh, we want to make sure that we're modeling healthy coping. Modeling a healthy coping for me was kind of hard, so I had to be really intentional about it. So what I do is I come home and I'll say, I'll make sure my daughter hears me. And I'll say, I had a really rough day. I'm just going to go for a walk and get some fresh air. Before, I used to say I want to take the dog for a walk, and that was my happy place. But now we have a puppy, and he's crazy, and so that's definitely not, no longer. That's been ruined. 
Um, so <laughs> you want it to be something that's gonna, gonna uh, bring you some peace. Um, another thing that I do is uh, we really wanna encourage our kids to talk when they're struggling. So I might say, um, maybe it's Saturday morning and I'll say, you know what, I've had a rough week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go have a cup of coffee with dad. I just wanna talk it out. I just need somebody to listen. And that's showing our kids that it's, it's okay and healthy to talk about their struggles uh, when they need to. And, and we definitely want them to come to us. So uh, then we also, we want to talk about teaching and modeling from, uh, to learn from our mistakes. Um, this is really cool. This is super interesting. Okay, so I made a mistake at work. We had a new CEO at Teen Esteem. This was a couple years ago, and her name is Kelly. Kelly is awesome, but I didn't know Kelly was awesome because she's new. So you know what it's like when you get a new boss. It's like, you know, who knows? So um, I made a mistake, and it was big enough where I knew I had to tell her about it, and I was definitely not looking forward to it. So I call her up, and I didn't want her to get blindsided, so I called her up, and I told her about it, and she said, oh, that is a bummer, but you know what? What can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And then we just worked it out, and we, we actually, you know, I had some ideas on how to address that, and, and we discussed it, and you know what that told me? That told me that she's on my side. I know she's not going to freak out if I make a mistake. And, and we're going to work together. And we want to create that kind of environment for our kids uh, where they feel comfortable coming to us if they've made a mistake, whether it's at school or at home. And, and the really cool thing is, is I can't remember what the mistake was, but I remember what she's, I remember her response. I remember how she made me feel. You know, have you ever heard the saying, people might not remember what you say or what you do, but they remember how you made how you made them feel. Um, so now I remember how she made me feel, and I know I can go to her with, with a mistake. I don't like to, but um, I know I can. So psychology today confirms this, and how they confirm this is two key factors for grit and resilience. The two key factors for grit and resilience. Oh, I think that's right there. Hi. Two key factors for grit and resilience. Number one, being okay with and learning from your mistakes. Being okay with and learning from your mistakes. And number two, working our brain like a muscle. So this is really interesting. Um, I have a couple of friends who are especially successful. And one of my friends, I've heard, I heard somebody say, you know what, everything she does, she succeeds. She, everything comes so easy for her. But I know her, my friend Tanya, I know her, and I've, been, I've seen her year after, uh, over the years, and time after time, she would fail and get back up, fail and get back up. Her tenacity just amazes me. So it didn't come easy. She failed a lot, but she kept getting back on that horse, and, that, and, and she wouldn't give up until she succeeded. Um, so that is an example of how you would use your brain like a muscle in that regard. It's kind of just getting back on that horse. Anybody, anybody grew up with horses? Anybody ever had a horse? I, I grew up in the country. We had horses. And I can tell you, it hurts to fall off. And, and it's kind of scary. They're huge animals. <laughs> and you're trying to control. And I was just a kid, like a 90-pound little girl. And, uh, yeah, I got thrown off. And, and it hurts. And it's, it's not easy to get back up. But if you don't get right back on, you may never get back on because it hurts. And it can be very scary. So, so that saying is kind of old, but it still holds true. Um, so, so again, the great news is some people, some kids are born with more grit and resilience than others. Some just seem to naturally have it. But you can learn it, you can develop it, and you can, you can work it like a muscle and you can improve it. Another thing from psychology today, this is really interesting. So they did a study. And when we make a mistake, our brain does two things. First, it acknowledges that a mistake was made. Then second, it starts trying to figure out how to fix the mistake. The fascinating part is for the people who said in advance that they felt that they could learn from their mistakes, there's way more brain activity going on during step number two when they're trying to figure it out than there was for the people who didn't think they could learn from their mistakes. 
Does that make sense? That, I mean, that gives me so much hope. That gives us so much hope. We can do this. We can do this. Um, so the good news is kids are going to give us lots of material because they're human and they're going to make lots of mistakes. Um, and so we're going to have a lot to work with. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of opportunities. Uh, before I go on to that, so if a mistake has been made, let's say um, an example might be if one of your kids has been begging you to get them a really expensive toy, like maybe a bike or something, and you finally cave in and you get it for them, and you tell you go through all the all the things, telling them how to make sure they take care of it, don't leave it out in the yard, et cetera, et cetera. And and then what happens? They leave it out in the yard and it gets stolen. Okay, so they've made a mistake and there's a big consequence. So how can we approach that? First of all, and this is really interesting, we want to make sure our kids know that we love them no matter what. We know that, but trust me, they don't know that. We talk to 18,000 kids a year. They do not know that, especially when they've made a mistake. That's when they're really vulnerable. So we want to make sure that they know that we love them and that we're proud of them. We're, we're sad for them. Uh, we're sad that they made a mistake that, that they, and that this mistake is going to cost them a lot. Um, but that's, that's definitely how you want to start the conversation. And then these are some questions that you might consider asking. Um, what did you learn from that? You know, uh, um, maybe it was a time management thing. Um, maybe it was just recklessness. Um, what, what might you have done differently? So beyond just obviously putting my bike away, well, what, what led that? What led to that happening? You know, was it because you didn't manage your time, so you just left it out in the yard, or was it were you just you know, not thinking or distracted or whatever. Um, and then consequences when appropriate. And I say when appropriate because every kid is different and every circumstance is different. That might have been your typically super responsible kid and it was a really extraordinary circumstance. Um, or it might have been kind of predictable. Uh, so, so that's everyone's unique and everyone has their own unique circumstances. Um, one of the things we want to make sure we don't do, and especially the younger I love seeing younger parents here because the earlier you start, the easier it is. Um, and you never want to make waste a good mistake. And these parents are brilliant. I think, Michael, are we able to play that? Hey, uh, we're back. Hey, Dad. What's up? Um, did y'all eat? Yeah, we ate. Why? Because I asked Mom to get me some. Did she get it? Did y'all um get it? Oh, um, babe. Yeah. Did you? Did he ask you to bring him something to eat? I forgot. Wow, yeah, and you told me, and I forgot to. That's crazy. Wow, people mm. forget things, right? Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, you definitely understand, right? Like, we asked you to clean your room yesterday, and you forgot, and but, take out yeah. the trash. But, you know, you forgot. So now we have to deal with trash for a whole nother week. So, you know, uh, you definitely dead. understand, I, I would assume. Um, but, you know, we will definitely try to make sure um, tomorrow, you know, we don't forget. I want to keep repeating that. That's, that, come on. Mm, wow. I love that. Tomorrow, you know, we'll make sure. Um, so, yeah, we, we never want to waste a good mistake. And, again, I cannot emphasize enough, it's so much easier to do it when they're younger. Um, you can always start. You can start at any time. But the, the younger they are, the easier it is. And trust me on that because I did not do this. Um, that would not be me. I would not be that parent. I probably would have ran back out and got it. Um, um, I, I would have, you know, would have not, you know, my kids would not have had consequences if, uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, it would not have had consequences for having forgotten to do anything. I, I was not very good at that. If my kid was the one that left the bike out, I probably would have grabbed him and run down to the store right then and there because I wouldn't want him to sit in his pain for even one minute. And, and not, not the way it should be handled. Not the way it should be handled, for sure. Um, there might be a project due at school tomorrow. And, and they come and tell you, my mission, state, what, do you guys still have to do the mission projects where you have to create a mission? Are you kidding? OK. That was a nightmare. That was a nightmare. So your kid comes to you, you know, it's due tomorrow. And Michael's is closed. And, and you know, I would be the one running around trying to find materials in the house and trying to figure it out. 
um, your kid might be, you know, they might have to go to school and be this super uncomfortable situation where they're the only kid that doesn't have a mission, which that would be a big deal, right? Like you have back to school parent night and, 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 uh, when you show off all your, all your mission projects and your kid doesn't have one, and it could affect their grade. It's a whole lot easier to happen in an elementary school. Uh, I won't tell you how many, okay, there's no teachers. Are there any teachers here? Ah, oh, once a teacher. <laughs> Who, has anybody done a project for their kid? Yeah, yeah, okay. My husband makes so much fun of me. He's like, mommy won science fair every year. <laughs> I was a little crazy when it came to science fair. I don't know why. I don't know why. But but yeah, we're we're not teaching them to stand on their own feet. And and honestly, we're we're sending the message, I don't think you can do it. So I've got to step in and do it for you. Um, so the other thing we want to make sure we do is we want to make sure our kids know that failure is not fa fatal um, or perceived failure. I mean, they again, if they they think a lot of kids think if they don't get an A, that they have failed. And that is not failing. A B is not failing. So my, one of my kids, my son, um, school comes kind of easy to him, and he wanted to go to this really expensive private school, and he knew if he was going to go that he had to get a really good scholarship. And he had some girlfriend problems and, and kind of was depressed and let his grades go, like really let them go. Um, and it was junior year, so it, it was pretty, pretty critical. Um, Going to that private school was completely out of the question now, and he ended up going to DVC. Um, I am not saying that DVC is only for kids that get derailed. Uh, that's what we call that at Tina Seam. He got derailed. Um, we love DVC. My daughter, my daughter goes there now, and she goes there for other reasons. But, but it is it's a great school. But his dream was now no longer going to happen, and he got derailed. But as I said, we we talk about this with kids. You can always get back on track. It might look a little bit differently, but you can always get back on track. So for my son, he went to DVC, he took a political science class, he ended up loving it, he went to Sac State, and now he's got an internship at the state capitol. So it all worked out, but it looked a lot differently than he originally thought. So failure is not fatal. That could be a perceived failure. He did not get into the school he wanted. A lot of our kids are not going to get into the school they want it. They want to because if they want to get into Stanford, as we said last month, they turn down almost everybody that applies. Their acceptance rate is 2 to 4%. So that means almost everybody that applies gets turned down. So if that's our kids' dreams, we have to make sure they have some backup plans. We have to make sure that they know that that's not a failure. But if they perceive it as a failure, it's, they can get back on track. They can get back on track. Um, we've all heard the quotes uh, about failure. We just, again, we just need to make sure our kids know. Because even if they're not hearing it at home, we're seeing so much pressure from themselves, from their peers, um, and it's very unhealthy. And then when they do fail, we can be there to help them, help them through it. So reminding them of their successes, this is one of my favorite things that we, that, uh, we teach at, at Tina Steam. Think, if you think for a minute, what's the first thing that comes to your head, comes into your head? A success that you've had or a failed, failure that you've had? And for most people, it's pretty easy to think of a failure. Um, and it takes a little bit to remember a success. So one of my kids, does, does Benicia High School, do they make you try out for cross country? Does anybody know? I, no other school does this. Okay, our school, Clayton Valley, you have to try out to get on the cross country team and it is really hard. It starts in July. You're running up really high hills. hills. You're running as fast as you can. It's super hot. It's really hard. And, it, and it's not easy to get on the team. And my daughter was not a runner. She decided she was going to join the cross country team and she tried out and she did not make it. My husband was a, he is, a, well, he blew out his knees, but, but he was a runner. So he, um, he encouraged her. He went out with her and he, he got her to get back in there and try again. She tried a second time and she still did not make it. So now they let her go. By now the season started. And she gets to go with the team, and she gets to go to the meets, but she doesn't get to wear the uniform because the uniform has to be earned. 
And by this time, anybody else that hadn't made it had already dropped out. So she was the only one. So she's sitting there with no uniform. It was so sad. Oh my gosh, it was so sad. But you know what? She stuck it out. And the next time she made it, the third time she got on the team, she made the trial. And now when she's struggling, I can remind her of that. I can remind her of how she failed, how she got back on that horse, how she got back up and tried again and tried again and tried again, even though it was embarrassing, it was hard, it was frustrating. There were lots of tears. So, so that's an example of trying to remind them of their successes. Um, you know, again, I can't emphasize enough when that happens. You want to remind them how much you love them. And even if you know it, they might not know it. One more big topic on this um, grit and, regarding grit and resilience is developing future problem solvers. When they know they can, they can solve their own problems, then that's going to give them a lot more confidence, and that's going to help them develop a lot more grit and resilience. So developing future problem solvers, what does that look like? Um, again, with the projects, you know, in, unless it's a project where they're supposed to work with the parents, um, you might want to, you know, give them some encouragement, you might want to give them a certain assistance, but you don't want to step in and do it for them. Again, that sends the message, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you've got what it takes. I'm going to have to do this for you. I have to bail you out. Um, instead, what you might want to do, like for instance, um, my daughter is taking some pretty, pretty challenging math classes. Um, just encourage them to find resources to be resourceful. There's a lot of information online. So um, what she has done is, is she goes to YouTube she, um, for younger kids. There's Khan Academy, I think it's called. You guys use that? That's amazing, huh? Is that still amazing? That, that was amazing for, for my kids when they were younger. Um, um, but yeah, just encouraging them to find, uh, find out how to solve their problem. Uh, maybe it's a conflict with a friend. Just encouraging them, asking them questions, but not just coming in like you're going to fix it. Um, and you've got all the answers, you know, uh, asking them, I don't know, do you have any ideas how to solve this? Um, and, and maybe they don't, but at least you're asking a, the question. So you're showing, you know what, I think you have something to add to this. I think you might have something, something of value to say um, regarding this. So, so just developing future problem solvers and being really intentional about it. Um, and then we have some additional tips. Um, talk with them like you're listening. This is a big one for busy parents. Uh, I was so terrible about this. You have to really set down your phone, make eye contact, and really show them that you're listening. And one thing, if you have teenagers especially, they love when you ask them their opinion. They love when somebody asks them their opinion. And they might say some pretty crazy things sometimes. I'm sure they will. But, you know, it, it's, it's still beneficial. It, it gives you some insight into where they're coming from, who they're listening to. You know, they might say, you know, you might say, well, oh, you think the earth is flat. Okay, where? wow, that's cool. Where'd you hear that? <laughs> And then you can find out where they're getting their information, what's kind of going on in their head and what they're, what they're listening to, what they're interested in, and, um, and again, where they're getting their information. And it, it's a conversation starter, right? Um, yeah, I talked to a pilot. He said, no, it's definitely, <laughs> you can see the curvature of the earth. <laughs> it's definitely round. But yeah, just not, not freaking out, not shaming them um, when, they, when they say something crazy. And then um, being their safe space, uh, being their safe space, um, your kids might come to you and say something that's pretty upsetting. Um, you know, I, you know, mom, I, I want you to know I tried marijuana and I'm kind of freaking out about it or something. You know, um, maybe on the inside you are absolutely freaking out, but on the outside you want to make sure. You don't want to scare them off. Think of them like a little alley cat. <laughs> so you don't want to scare them off. So just say, wow, that, that must have been really hard. I'm really proud of you. That takes a lot of courage to come to me. That must have been really scary. Um, now let's talk about that. Um, I'm really glad that you came to me. But, but just not freaking out and, and, and encouraging them to realize that you are safe, that you're a safe space. Um, 
taking responsibility for their actions, when you can become comfortable with doing this, it is so much growth. You'll see so much growth in your kids. I didn't get to this point till I was in my 20s. And I remember at some point, and it was at my first, my first real job, where if I made a mistake, I realized it was okay. You know, it was okay if I made a mistake and I could take responsibility if I didn't meet my goal or if I, if I did something wrong because I knew I was doing my best. And I knew there was nothing you know, innately wrong with me. Um, I knew I was a good employee. I knew I was a good, you know, reliable person. And just, just that confidence that that builds. Um, so encouraging your kids. I talked to one parent who said they actually, if there's consequences, if their kids are going to get consequences, they know that the consequences are going to be far less if they take responsibility for their actions. And instead of you just happening to find out, mom and dad just happened to find out. Um, so I would encourage that. I think that that is a fantastic idea. We also, um, embracing them for who they are. Uh, maybe they're not like you. Um, my, I am not creative at all. Um, I'm super logical. My husband and my son are the same way. My daughter is not. She's just this anomaly. She's super artistic and creative. And she was in drama and she loves to sing. And she took singing lessons and she did all this stuff. And it was so hard for me because I couldn't even, <laughs> I, I didn't even know where to start to try to um, develop some of those, um, some of those passions in her. But I would just tell her, you know what, I, I'm just amazed. You're so creative. Even when she cooks, now she's older and she cooks. And I can't believe you're so creative. And, and I, you know, I can't imagine being able to draw like this and just really embracing them for who they are, not who we are or who we hope they might be. Um, connecting with their child, we always encourage this. As they get older, that can be a little bit more difficult. But when your kids know that they have a family that they can go to that loves them, that's going to be there for them, they're their safe people, and they're connected to you, that's going to go a really long ways with uh, when problems happen and they need to have that grit and resilience. They're going to have that foundation. So um, connecting with your kids when they're younger uh, looks a little different than when they're older. When they're younger, um, you might be on the ground playing with fire trucks when they're five years old or, or with uh, My Little Pony or whatever. But um, as they get older, it, as I said, it's more challenging. With my son, I, um, he, he was on electronics all the time, and he had a YouTuber that he followed. So ask them who their favorite YouTuber is. Ask, ask them if they have a comedian that they follow. And so we started watching his favorite comedian every time he came out with a new video. Um, so that was a great way for us to connect. And then he'd tell me, oh, Olson Rogers has another, has another video out. So we'd curl up on the couch and, and uh, watch, watch a, his comedian. And, and he was watching me to see if I was enjoying myself, because that really means a lot to them. Um, so he, he, I'd see him looking out of the corner of his eye to see if I was laughing. Um, and I was. The guy was super funny. The guy was super funny. So um, that was a great way you know, to be able to curl up on the couch with your high school son is amazing. So I highly encourage you to just, just explore that and find out what they like. Not might not be what you like, uh, but what they like. And then um, going to a, a kind of a coaching, not controlling. And it's so hard. It's so hard. I know. I know. I was, yeah, helicopter mom. Um, but it gives them confidence. You're giving them confidence when you do that and when you don't do everything for them. Just like with um, with my son, um, he would at when he was in elementary school, we lived right around the corner, and he would forget his homework all the time. Excuse me, <sighs> he would forget his homework all the time, and I loved being able to run run down there and take it to him, and I would do it at the drop of a hat. And then as soon as I got a job where I was at an office all day, first time he called and said, or texted or whatever, and said, I don't have my homework. I'm like, oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. I can't get it for you. That was the last time he forgot his homework. Literally the last time he, that I know of that he forgot his homework. So then he had to learn to be responsible, to set his stuff out, 
the night before to make sure he gave himself enough time in the morning that he wasn't running around and forgetting things. Um, with my daughter, I would be glad to take her her homework because I literally mean like from, from kindergarten through 12th grade, I think she forgot her homework once, maybe twice. So, so I wasn't, you know, I'm not saying never take your kids their homework and never take their kids their lunch if they forgot it. But you know what, if they forget their lunch and they have to eat that uh, cafeteria food and, and I don't know, Benicia might be great, but <laughs> in our school, not so great. So, so that's going to encourage them to, to remember uh, um, to take their lunch. So so kind of a coaching and, and not controlling. Um, and then just nurturing independence. And this, for um, as your kids get older, you're going to see so much growth when, you, when they have the confidence to go out and do something on their own. So with our kids, that was getting a job um, at AutoZone or, or Chick-fil-A. Um, but it might be doing some volunteer work. Um, working at, at a food pantry, doing something like that. But just encouraging their independence and, and encouraging them to do something like that really, really shows them, I can do this on my own. I can adult. I can be an adult. I got this adulting thing down. And then, again, unconditional love. Don't forget, even if they don't think, even if you are sure that they must know, there are times when they're going to question it. So always make sure that they know that you love them. Now, um, if you're seeing um, a sudden lack in grit and resilience and, and your kids are just kind of curling up in a ball and they're, they're losing interest in things and, and just not trying, realize that there might be something going on. Um, you, if you try to talk to them, you know, maybe bullying or something like that going on, um, you might want to talk to their teacher. So if you're seeing a sudden, a sudden dramatic um, change in that, you might want to check on that. But, um, yeah. That's uh, grit and resilience. Um, so I would love if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you want additional information. I loved how you talked about um, making them problem solvers and you know, when kids are little, when my kids were little anyway, I always tried to go fix everything for them, right? You try to not have them figure it out because it's faster and sometimes it takes a long time to go through the process. But I remember one time um, we kicked a ball over the fence into the neighbor's yard. And, and we see this a lot in schools too. Is kids automatically, what do they do? They look to you like, well, what do I do now? And so normally I'd go walk myself over there and go get the ball or tell them what to do. But instead it was, well, what do you think you could do? How could you fix this? And it took three days for them to figure out, I can go knock on the door. I mean, they were little, little, but it took a lot of control not to just solve it for them, but just keep asking those questions. And so you can do it with simple little things that are not, you know, uh, don't have huge consequences. And I think that's really important because otherwise they don't, they just sit and wait for you to fix it. Yeah, um, yeah, and that happens in all areas of their life. So I liked that part of this. I love that. That's a great example. And and yeah, for three days you were probably in agony. It's like, <laughs> it would have been so much easier. <laughs> yeah, but that's and the other reason I love that example is because when they're younger, it's so much easier to start at a younger age because things get harder as they get older. Um, you know, missing your mission mission project in elementary school. You know, it has consequences, but they get bigger when you're in middle school and bigger still when you're in high school and, and, and your grades are really um, important. So. so, Julie, I noticed listening, I, I, I loved all your, all the things that we were talking about. I noticed, would you agree that the overall thing is you're asking parents to really just be present all the time, like during the good stuff, during the bad stuff, during the hard stuff? Right? Would you would you say that too? Like overall, absolutely being yeah. present, yeah. showing up and and hanging out. I know that my eighth graders used to say the number one thing that they they struggled with their parents was that their parents weren't available to them. They had their phones, they weren't available, and the parents would come in and they'd say, 
the number one thing that my kids never available. They're on their phones. They're not available. So, mm -hmm. so that being present, I loved when you talked about putting your phone down, looking at them. Yeah. Thought that was really cool. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I love that. It's that's very true. It it's there aren't any shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. Yeah, yeah. Just like with the screens, when we talked about screens, you know, it's there's no easy answer. You've got to be there. You've got to have the hard conversations, continual conversations connections um, yeah same thing so yeah thanks Carmen anybody else has anything I'm jamming out the last night so yeah well thank okay. you very much yeah. this was terrific um, we will be putting this up on um, our YouTube channel and I'll send it out to folks so if you weren't able to be here or watch via the live stream we'll send it out and it'll be on our website so you can watch again but thank you all for being here thank you Julie it was great thank you thank you